Hi, this is Matt Miranda, Guadalupe County 4-H agent, and today uh, this video is going to give you a little information on the Texas 4-H scholarship program, as well as some more local scholarships that you will be able to apply for, uh, especially in the spring, but upcoming for all graduating seniors. Um, if you are a junior in high school, this would be a good recording to watch as well, because it will give you an idea of what you need to pre prepare for in the coming years. Some useful tools to help you along your way um, include the scholarship application and the instructions. You need to be sure to read all the instructions and make sure that you have all the information necessary to fill out the form. It's a good idea to have a copy of your 4-H records. If that's a record book or a, a award application or anything like that from the past, all of those records can be used because this is a full um, scholarship, especially the 4-H one, it wants information from your entire 4-H career. You'll need your scholastic records, which include your grades, transcripts, SAT scores, all those kinds of things. Um, your family's financial records, uh, because you will need to fill out the FAFSA for this scholarship. And you'll need time. Don't wait till the last minute. We've had far too many kids uh, over the years that say they're going to fill it out and they're not able to because um, of time. This is not something that's going to take a day. This will take you several days work to research and to write and to revise uh, to make sure that you have the best application possible. <clears throat> when completing your application, uh, best thing to do is brainstorm and gather your information beforehand. Um, it's hard to go back while you're filling stuff out to try to find more information, uh, but that's part of the revision process. Um, you'll need to read and uh, carefully follow all instructions and directions. If it tells you to write something a certain way, then you need to do it that way. Don't add extra pages if it doesn't say that you can. Don't say see attachment if it doesn't say, if it, if it says that the information has to go in that form. Be sure to read those instructions. Um, proofread and make sure that others have a chance to review and critique your paper, your essays, your application as well because that will help you build it up. Be sure to complete all the sections that it says and emphasize quality as well as quantity. Um, a person that doesn't may have a whole bunch of uh, experiences in 4-H but that doesn't necessarily mean that the 4-H'er with less experiences didn't have a more meaningful project. So be sure to emphasize the quality of your project as well as the quantity. And think about your application from a judge's point of view. Be sure to look at the judge's sheets, the scorecards from all these scholarships, whether it be for 4-H or um, FFA or whatever it may be. Look at the score sheet and see what they're looking for. That will help you build your scholarship application to a format that the judges can find the correct information in. To complete your applications, um, just keep in mind another couple of things that your high school counselors need time to collect all your official transcripts um, or section 5 for the 4-H scholarship. So be sure to ask early and ask often. Uh, if you haven't heard back from your counselor in a few days, go stop in and remind them. Send them an email. Face to face is always best. Make sure high school um, tests have been met and that you have grades and that you're able to pass your college entrance exams. Narrate uh, Narratives that have only been written once are rarely effective. So when you are writing your narratives, that's your the essay portions of these scholarships, don't think that you're able to write it once and turn it in and it's going to be perfect. You need to have somebody revise it, send it to me and I'll look it over. Um, send it to somebody that you trust to read it and give you good uh, constructive feedback on it. Um, printer problems and computer crashes are a fact of life. So plan ahead. Save your work in more than one area. Uh, a good rule of thumb is to email something to yourself. Because then it is, if you don't have a thing like Dropbox or some kind of online Apple Drive or something like that, you can email it to yourself and at least it will be stuck in your email. Uh, be sure to start early and edit often because a paper turned in one time without any edits, again, like I said earlier, is rarely effective. 
Um, if you are if you're needing letters of recommendation, um, here's some things that you need to keep in mind. They show that people respect your skills and accomplishments and are willing to say so in writing and sign their name on that. So it is a um, big honor to get a uh, letter of recommendation. It's something that not everybody will be able to get um, or that you, you really have to have trust in whoever's writing this letter, that you trust them to say something good about you. Um, and really that, that those people are nice enough and willing to write something about it, about you, um, that shows a lot about what they think about you as well. So people that you can consider when asking for these, uh, extension agents, we're always willing to, ag teachers, your teachers at school, your employer, a uh, religious leader, whether that's a priest or a rabbi or a pastor or whoever that may be. Um, your coaches, friends of the family with credibility. So if you have a friend of the family that's a lawyer or a doctor or something like that, um, all of those are good choices for a potential letter of recommendation. Be sure to review your scholarship directions for specifics about these letters. So some scholarships may ask for two letters, one from a teacher and one from some uh, member of the community. Read the instructions and make sure that you're getting the letters that you need. You won't need a letter of recommendation for the 4-H scholarship unless you are applying for the Courageous Heart, which we will talk about later. Uh, you may be able to use the same letter of recommendation for multiple applications. It just depends on how the letter was written and who the letter was written to. Each letter should be addressed to a specific individual or a scholarship fund. Have the writer use an official letterhead if they have one, if possible. Um, so if you get a letter from us here at the Extension Office, it'll be written on our 4-H letterhead. And after you receive the letter, be sure to write the writer a thank you note. They are taking the time to write you a thank you or a recommendation letter. You need to take the time to thank them for what they've done. Um, you need to recognize that writing a letter of recommendation is not a simple task. It's not something that can be done overnight a lot of times. Um, and it's difficult because when we write recommendation letters, we are really looking, we want to write something that puts you in a positive light. Um, and we want to make sure that we get it right. So um, be sure to give plenty of time when doing this. The easiest way to get one is to ask. Um, it's not anyone's job to write these. So ask people. And the, I mean, the worst they can do is tell you no. So ask people, uh, be polite about it. If possible, do it in person uh, because it's much harder to tell somebody no in person than it is um, over an email. Provide the writer with details on the scholarship and what the donor is looking for in a letter. Um, it is okay to give your, um, tra not your transcript, but your resume with for information that um, might help the writer make your letter a better one. And give your letter writers plenty of time to write. Um, I have had to write some recommendation letters with very, very short deadlines. Um, I'm able to do that because it is part of my, or it's related to my job, but not everyone will be able to do that. So give your recommendation letter writer plenty of time to write it. And then respect what they write about you. Um, it may not be exactly what you were looking for, but they took the time to write something for you um, to help you and support your continued education. So thank them and appreciate what you get. In preparing for interviews, there's several things that you can do to make yourself as uh, prepared as possible. Uh, the biggest one being dress for success. Uh, your first impressions are made in the first couple of seconds a judge or interviewer um, sees you. So if you look, if you're not dressed professionally when you go in, um, and when I say professional, I mean a pantsuit or a dress for the girls, a uh, suit with a coat and tie for the boys, um, no blue jeans, nothing like that. Um, you need to be b what we call business professional. Professional Doesn't need to wear a tuxedo or anything like that, but it needs to be business professional. Um, so be sure to dress for success. Make sure your shoes are shined. Make sure your tie is um, put on straight. 
um, your hair is kempt, all those kinds of things. Um, make sure that you learn about the organization you are interviewing with. I have been scholarship judge for um, several different organizations, and one of the questions we always ask um, is, tell us what you know about this organization, and a lot of kids do not know how to answer that question. They don't know anything about the organization that they're applying to get money from. So before you go in for an interview, be sure to review that organization, what they do, when they were founded, what is their mission, all those kinds of things, because that's all very important. Be sure to review any suggested questions that the uh, scholarship committee may have sent you. Uh, with the 4-H scholarship, we do have suggested questions that when we get to that point in this process, um, we will sit down with you and help you prepare for that interview. And be aware of current events. Um, one of the things that they may ask you for the 4-H scholarship is, especially is tell us how this XYZ current event is affecting youth or affecting you. Um, when I was growing up, the question that they asked all of us was, how did September 11th affect your life? Um, September 11th was a major event in uh, my generation's life. And so they wanted to know how that affected us. Um, but uh, I know they've asked questions about North Korea and different um, other major current events, uh, different house bills and how they would affect uh, schools and kids. So keep that in mind. Be aware, be aware of your current events. And then practice and record yourself. Practice as often as possible. If you need to record yourself on a video or on a tape recorder or on your phone recorder on your phone, um, anything to listen to yourself, to see yourself present and see what your facial expressions are, your hand gestures. Um, as I'm sitting here get, doing this, I'm moving my hands around because that's how I talk. So um, be sure to keep those things in mind. Now there are a variety of scholarship applications available. Um, you can get them from our office uh, or our website, I should say, at guadalupe.agrilife.org uh, and then click on 4-H and then scholarships. Also talk to your school counselors at your school for additional scholarship opportunities. The first scholarship we're going to talk about today is the Texas 4-H Foundation Scholarship. Um, this is going to be the most information we give you because this is not a um, simple scholarship application to fill out. As I said earlier, it's not something you can fill out in a day, but it is a good way to get a lot of information together on your entire 4-H career. Um, and that's what we're looking at with this scholarship application. We are looking at your full 4-H career, whether that be one year or 10 years. Um, that's the information that we're looking for in this scholarship application. So it does take time to fill out. Just a quick look at some deadlines. We're doing our training now um, in November and December is when you need to fill out your FAFSA. And we'll talk more about FAFSA here in a little bit. January 23rd, 2019 is when the application is due to me at the County Extension Office in Seguin. Um, February 1st is when we have to have things turned in to the district office and this year we're going to be doing that differently. We're going to be uploading all of our forms onto 4-H Connect. Uh, February 16th is usually when everything is due in the state 4-H office. April of 2019 is when you will be notified of if you get an interview. Just because you get an interview does not guarantee a scholarship, but it's a good sign of things to come. Um, and then May 3rd through 5th of 2019, the interviews will be in College Station. Um, during that time, if you have a um, meaningful thing that you have to miss that interview for, you can reschedule the interview or you can call and try to reschedule the interview with the State 4-H office. If it is a 4-H event, um, they try to work with you on that. But if you are missing the interview just to get ready for the prom, or any other thing like that going on that time of year. Um, it is a too bad, so sad situation. You have to go to the interview in order to get the scholarship. Remember, this is a chance at $20,000, um, and that's not something to take lightly. If you are lucky enough to get one of the scholarships, then um, you will be required to be in College Station 
uh, on one of those days, June the 11th through the 13th in 2019, uh, there will be an awards assembly in College Station, and you will receive your scholarship that day. You are required to attend that. No ifs, ands, or buts. You must be there. Um, so keep that in mind. Some new things for 2019. All applicants that are invited to participate uh, in an interview are not necessarily guaranteed a scholarship. When you go to the interviews, you need to make sure you have a good interview, that you're paying attention, that you're smiling, that you are participating in an interview, and not just going through the motions. You don't want to lose a scholarship necessarily based on just the interview. Um, applicants will not be excused from either the interview or the scholarship assembly, meaning you must attend. If you don't attend either one, you will not get a scholarship. Uh, you're, if you took the SAT before or January 2016 or before, um, or the scores from March 2016 or later, all of those scores will be accepted as well as your ACT scores. Um, any youth receiving a Terry Foundation scholarship are not eligible to receive a 4-H scholarship. So if you are lucky enough to get a Terry Foundation scholarship, that means you have uh, a full ride to whatever school you're attending. You don't need a 4-H scholarship. So we will, um, they will not give you a 4-H scholarship if you already received the Terry Foundation. All paperwork, um, all forms and all that will have to be scanned and uploaded to 4-H Connect. Um, and the way we're going to do that in our county is when you are ready to turn in your final exam your final copy, you'll come here to the office, we'll scan things here at the office, and then um, upload it to 4-H Connect here. That way we know that everything is where it needs to be before it goes on to the district level. Um, and section 6 in the forms will be different this year, um, and we will talk about that momentarily. As you can see, each stock show um, has its own requirements for um, cr or criteria for the scholarships. So if you um, are wanting a uh, Fort Worth Syndicate scholarship, it shows that you will have to have an ag major. If you're applying for the Houston Livestock Show scholarship, you have to be top 25% uh, of your class but there is no major requirement. Um, one thing important to note about the Houston Livestock Show is that you must not have received more than $90,000 in scholarships in order to get that one. Um, that is their limit. Of course, it is difficult to get to that limit these days. Um, there's so, I mean, there's so many people applying for scholarships, but keep that in mind when the uh, information comes out on November 1st, be sure to review it and um, look to see what different scholarships um, have different requirements. Keep in mind that when you are applying for the 4-H scholarship, you are actually putting yourself in a pool of about 200 different scholarships that the committee will then decide which one um, fits you best based on your grades, your 4-H participation, and other um, requirements in the, the process. So these scholarships, the 4-H scholarships, are academic scholarships first and foremost. That is, they are awarded based on your academic record in school, your 4-H experience, and financial need. Um, there is a financial need requirement for only some of the scholarships, but it is taken into account for all scholarships. Um, with that being said, you could have a stellar 4-H career, be a top 4-H'er, -er, been to uh, state council and been to national events and done many things and still not get a scholarship if you don't have the grades. Um, so that's why it's important to um, have all of the requirements. And this is not something that is set by 4-H. This is donor driven. Um, and so we must follow what our donors tell us that we need to have in there. And it's important to have grades. I mean, you're there in putting a big investment into you and they want to see the, a return on that investment. They want to see that um, you are succeeding in college. There will be approximately 200 scholarships that will be awarded, and the amount of the scholarships will range anywhere from $3,000 to $20,000. Um, that is not counting the TEA scholarship um, or the school, the school tour scholarship from San Antonio Livestock Show. Um, those scholarships are $1,000. And we'll talk more about sales school tours scholarships in a minute. 
There are three types of scholarships available. There's your uh, four-year scholarships for those that are um, willing to pursue a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Arts. There is a scholarship available for students that are wishing to pursue a technical certification and a technical school. And then there's the Courageous Heart Scholarship, which is uh, awarded to 4-H members that have overcome extreme obstacles in their personal life related to medical, family, or educational needs, and have still rem remained a member of both 4-H and school. Some general eligibility rules for the scholarship including include you must be a member of 4-H, a paid member on 4-H Connect of the 4-H program. You must be a United States citizen and a Texas resident. You must be scheduled to graduate from a Texas high school, public, private, or home during the 2018-2019 school year. Have made formal application to a Texas college, university, or technical school. You can't get this scholarship or any of these scholarships if you are attending a school out of state. Um, that you meet the entrance requirements for the college that you are applying for. That you submit a current scholarship application completely filled out. And then all applications must meet the minimum requirements to be considered for judging. Um, we will not be submitting any scholarships from our office um, to the district level and then on to state if they don't meet minimum requirements. Um, that is not because we're being mean or anything like that, but we don't want you to get your hopes up if you're not, if you don't have the minimum eligibility requirements. With that being said, this is a good scholarship form to fill out to get a lot of good information condensed down into smaller amounts. So it would be a good idea to at least fill out parts of this scholarship application, um, even if you're not going to apply for it. For the four-year scholarship, uh, you will be required to turn in your SAT or your ACT scores. You will need a minimum of a 950 on your SAT if you took it March 2016 or later, and that would be most of you out there, unless you took it as a freshman or sophomore in high school. Uh, so you'll need a minimum of a 950 on your SAT. Uh, SAT scores have to be all from the same date. You can't take your best SAT score from one sitting um, in math and then from writing or from the English and another one and combine them. It, it, won't, it can't work that way. Um, you also need a minimum score of a 19 on your ACT and no updated test scores will be accepted after the application date. So be sure to take your SAT now. Be sure to be in the upper half of your class based on scholastic rank for the first 3.5 years of your school. And uh, Houston and Walrus scholarships require that applicants be in the upper quartile of their class as well. You should also have a 90 GPA or higher to be competitive in this scholarship process. For the technical scholarship, you must not have plans to continue your formal education at a Texas college or university after the completion of the technical program. However, if you decide later that you want to go back and, and get a four-year degree, that is your prerogative. For the Courageous Heart Scholarship, you'll have to complete the additional pages in the scholarship application. For this scholarship, you do not need to have the minimum SAT or ACT scores. Courageous Heart applicants cannot be considered for other Texas 4-H Opportunity Scholarships. This is a $5,000 scholarship that you receive, uh, and you have to have documentation of the obstacles that you have overcome. What I would say is this is not something you would apply for if you had a really good 4-H career and then you tore your ACL um, or that you broke a bone or something like that. These are major, with this it is major obstacles that you overcome. The loss of a close family member, the loss of a limb, a major illness that, that affected your life, um, a life-threatening illness, all of those kinds of things would be more of what the Courageous Heart Scholarship is put together for. The 2019 application will be available on, in Word on our county website starting November 1st. Uh, that is when it will be released from the State 4-H office. There are samples on the website and we'll show you how to format your application. 
Um, there's one on section seven and some of the other sections of some different ways that you can do that. Um, you'll need to submit the most current application. So our uh, website will link you directly to the page with all of the forms on it. Um, if you are homeschooled, you'll need to provide an official transcript. Um, if you need help with this, contact me and it will have to be notarized to make it um, legitimate. And then you'll have to have proof of completing all your state required standardized tests and graduating in Texas College University. Um, or have proof of the standardized test exemption. So for scoring the, the scholarship application, it is a 100 point scale. There will be a scoring system just like um, on this screen that they will release. So you can look at what different things are um, kept in mind as they go through the scholarship process. Um, so keep that in mind as you fill out your application. The application must be fully completed to receive consideration. All sections must be filled out. It needs to be computer generated and prepared or typed with a typewriter. Do not handwrite it. You must require, you must include all required attachments, which also include your official transcript, your ACT and SAT scores, a copy of your FAFSA student aid report, and your college catalog pages with your major of study. The following are each section that are in this scholarship application, and we will go into each one um, in detail in just a moment. Sections one through four are on the first page of the application. Section one is the personal information page, which includes what type of scholarship you're applying for, your name, your address, and various things like that. Section two is your college and university information. It will ask you to list three schools that you have applied to um, attend, and then you'll need to put whether or not you were accepted or not. Um, even if you haven't been accepted yet, put three schools that you are applying for, up to three schools. Um, be sure to list the major and the department for each of the schools that you are attending and that, or that you would like to attend. And you need to list your future career uh, that you plan on pursuing. That does not mean that the career that you are planning on right now is going to be the one that you graduate with. Um, everybody changes. When I filled out this application as a kid, I put on there I wanted to be a meteorologist and now I'm an extension agent. So. Uh, plans do change. Section three is also on the first page and it is the livestock participation uh, section. Some shows require that your that the applicant has been uh, exhibitor at their show. So make sure to indicate the actual year that you participated in the show, not the number. You won't be doing a range of years, say 2007-2015. Um, we don't want to do that. Instead, what you'll be doing is listing them as here on the screen, 2005, 2006, 2007. And then if you skip a year, if you miss a year, then you just comma and go on to the next years. You don't want to put four years participating, 10 years participating. Section four is for the San Antonio Livestock Show School Tours. This, if you check this box, yes, then this makes you eligible for a school tour scholarship if you are planning to be a school tour guide um, this next spring at the San Antonio Stock Show. They do check to see that you were actually there and that you participated and that you were not sent home because you did something wrong. So be sure to check that box and then sign up to be a school tour guide. Uh, you will only get a school tour guide scholarship it, those the kids that get those are usually kids that do not get a um, interview so keep that in mind section 5 is filled out by your school counselor principal vice principal registrar somebody at the school um, serving in an official role for the applicant this record uh, must be returned to the applicant so you have to take this page and give it to somebody at the school for them to fill out um, it must have a true class ranking, even if you're homeschooled. You have to be ranked as one of one. 
because you have to be in the top 50% of your class um, to be eligible for this scholarship. You must have a quart the quartile ranking of the applicant on there as well. Homeschoolers are automatically um, top quarter. Um, all GPAs must be on a 100 point unweighted scale. So even if your school does GPA on the 4.0 scale, there is a formula that your school can use to figure out what your GPA is on a 100 point unweighted scale. They have to provide that. They have to write it on the paper um, along with your test scores and all that um, to be eligible for the scholarship. If you are having issues with your school and they don't want to do it or don't know how to do it, have them con or have them contact me or you contact me and I will contact them. Um, usually if you tell them that this is gonna, if they don't have this one little thing, you'll miss out on a chance at $20,000. They usually find a way to get it fixed. Um, because failure to provide class and quartile ranking will uh, result in disqualification. Section six is all on financial information. Um, it's collected and evaluated in two forms. One of that is the FAFSA, um, and then there's a financial need narrative. The FAFSA is something that you go to fafsa.ed.gov to fill out, um, and you will use your tax information from this year, from the spring of this year when you filled out taxes. Um, you will use your tax information to fill out the FAFSA. When that is complete, it will generate a um, report called a student aid report and you should be able to access it um, as a PDF that you will need to print out and it will be usually in very small writing and it will provide you an expected financial uh, family contribution or financial contribution, an EFC amount as what can be planned on to be paid from parents. That does not mean that your parents are going to be able to pay that. That is just according to taxes what the federal government says is possible. Um, so you will need that student aid report and that EFC to be to turn in um, with the scholarship application. That is why now is the time to apply. It can take three to four weeks for it to process. Um, that's why you don't want to wait until you do your, your taxes next spring you will have to fill out a new FAFSA every year um, in the spring of every year after your parents do taxes um, or after you do pa taxes, parents out there, um, to be eligible for different grants, Pell Grants, scholarships, student loans, all of those kinds of things. So fill out your FAFSA now and then you'll fill out a new FAFSA in the spring that'll be for your scholarships at your school that you're applying for. Uh, FAFSA also helps you find and obtain other financial aid as well. Fill it out, you never know what you're gonna be offered. Submit the FAFSA student aid report along with the application. Uh, one part of section six is a chart to list all the scholarships that you have applied for. And uh, this year, we are not asking for that form um, when you first apply. Um, this form will be asked for if you get a interview, because then we'll want to know what other scholarships you have applied for. Um, if, you're at, if you as the applicant has not um, or has applied for any other support, then you have to list it on that form at that time. Um, you'll need to provide the name of the support, whether it's a scholarship or grant, and include the amount per year. Uh, if no amount is listed, ask somebody that got it before, look it up and see what past amounts have. Um, other things that it will ask for is if the scholarship is renewable, what is the total value of the scholarship, whether or not it's been confirmed, meaning that you have the money or you've been awarded the scholarship, declined or pending. And then if the applicant has selected is selected for an interview, then you'll be able to fill out this form. So you will not need to fill out this part of section six. It won't be part of the form packet. Um, but keep in mind that if you get an, a scholarship, there that is something you will have, to, or if you get a scholarship interview, I should say, that is something you'll have to fill out. What part of section six you will have to fill out is the financial narrative. 
and um, this is where you let the judges know why you need financial aid. Um, do not start the essay with, I deserve this scholarship because X, Y, and Z. Um, this scholarship application is a time where you do get to brag on yourself. You have to brag on yourself. And we teach you all these years not to brag on yourself, to be humble, um, to have humility. Um, but this is where you want to put yourself in the best light possible to give yourself the opportunity to get this scholarship. So you have to find different ways to say that you need this money. Uh, some things that you can do is talk about the cost of college, whether you think you have financial need or not. Um, college is expensive. Uh, Four-year university is expensive to go to. Um, even a technical school is expensive to go to. So talk about what the costs are. How much student debt you may be expected to have after a four-year degree. Um, those are all good things. Um, talk about is like issues that you've had um, with family situations. Maybe somebody had an illness. Maybe you had a, a fire that you lost property. Um, maybe your uh, home was damaged in Hurricane Harvey or another disaster. Um, any kind of financial burden that has been placed on your family are things that you can talk about in this essay. If you are a recipient of any Houston Livestock Show scholarship, though, you may not receive more than $90,000. So be sure uh, later when we are filling all that out to keep that in mind that your scholarship, your Houston scholarship may be reduced to keep you under that $90,000 threshold. But um, this essay, along with all the essays, what I expect everyone to do is to fill out this essay and email it to me. That way I can um, suggest different ways that you can um, make it better. Um, to suggest spelling, like to look for spelling and grammar issues. Um, and then we, you'll do that. That way at least one person is there telling you ways that you could revise it. Sections 7 through 10 are all experience pages. So these can be taken from things like your 4 H record book, your past award applications, a member achievement plan or map. You guys will be the last generation of 4 Hers that may have still filled out a map. We don't haven't done them in a very long time, but when you were eight and nine years old, uh, you would have filled one out. And other personal records. Remember, uh, information must be presented in the space provided. You must uh, stress the quality of your project work rather than just the quantity. Section 7 is just on project experiences. It is one page to list up to four projects throughout your whole time in 4-H. In those pages, you will describe the years involved, your knowledge and skills gained, the scope of your activity related to the project, and any demonstrations, talks, workshops, tours, and interviews that you've attended. Um, there is a good example on our county website that talks about um, two different things. On one side, we put uh, the different numbers of experiences and the level of the experience that you had. And on the right, you talk about the significance of those experiences. You were in the leadership project for 10 years. You did X, Y, and Z. So what? That is where you talk about the impact it has had on you, the skills that you have learned, and why all of that is important. The application is for your entire 4-H career, not just the past four years like with record books. So be sure to describe why these projects were important to you, what impact it had on you, um, and what impact it had on other people when you were able to provide them with education or help them in some way. Section eight is on leadership experiences, and these are more leadership roles. Um, you have space to list up to 25 major leadership roles. Uh, keep in mind, you can only fill up one page. So what you'll have to do, you may have to pare down what you put in there. You may not be able to put in 25, but what we do want to see is that you're able to include information on whether or not that was volunteer, promotional, elected, or appointed leadership. List your roles and responsibilities, all the stuff that you did as that leader, not just that you were a leader. 
um, your year, your years of, of participation, levels of involvement, and any duties and accomplishments that you did. Briefly describe why those activities were important and what impact um, your involvement had to other people. Why was it important to be in that position? And put emphasis on the quality of the experience rather than quantity. You may have been an officer every year of your 4-H career, but you may also have some much more um, prestigious or higher level leadership experiences like Texas 4-H Congress or State Roundup or Leadership Lab or something like that. So if you need the extra room, you can combine things. Maybe you could say one leadership role was officer for 10 years in the Seguin 4-H Club. Um, so be sure to keep those kinds of things in mind. Section 9 is on your community service and citizenship experiences as well as your 4-H awards and honors. In the community service area, you can list up to 15 major citizenship and community service projects. There are 15 spots. Um, keep in mind, these are word forms, so as you type, the boxes expand. Uh, so you may have to cut some stuff out. What I would say first is to write it all in the forms, and then you can edit it down if you need to later. List your roles, your responsibilities, your levels of involvement, and any duties and accomplishments, numbers of people that you reached or helped. Describe why the activities were important and what kind of impact they had on other people. And again, emphasize quality over quantity. Um, another thing, at the bottom of that page, it will give you a space to list your four top 4-H honors that you've received. Um, list the honor year, the award received, the level of the award, and why it was important to you as the applicant. Um, of course, if you were a 4-H gold star, you would want to put that because that is the highest award that you can get in 4-H. But I've had 4-Hers that have put um, what I thought at the time were strange awards, like second place at the county fair. And I asked them, well, I know you've done this and this and this. You've won all these awards, your scholarships. Why is this on here? And they've told me, well, because that was the award that made me want to stay in 4-H. It made 4-H important enough to me to be a part of. So keep that in mind. You will want to put what the impact or the importance to you that award has been. That's what judges want to see is a personal touch to this. Section 10 is all of your outside 4-H experiences. So that's FFA, sports, band, um, any kind of community service outside of 4-H, work experience. What I would say for this section is to separate it by organization or by function. So have a, a different little box for FFA and one for band and one for football and one for church. That way the judges can uh, see it organized better. Don't just use the bulleted list um, and list any leadership roles you had outside of 4-H as well. If you were National Honor Society, this is the place to put it. Section 11 is your personal narrative, and this is another one-page essay um, that you need to highlight any information that you feel the judges should know about you and about your 4-H career. Try not to um, duplicate what you've already put in there, but if there's something that you really wanted to expand on, if you were a 4-H water ambassador and you wanted to talk about how that... Um, shaped your 4-H career, we'll talk about it in this area. This is like the 4-H story in the record book. Um, it just is uh, condensed. And so it's information that you believe the selection committee should know when considering your application. Include any personal obstacles that you've overcome during your 4-H career, um, if you, or if you've had goals that you've met, or goals that you didn't meet, um, and how that helped you along your way. Your space should be used wisely, so don't repeat or relist information already addressed in the application and use only the space provided. It cannot go on the reverse side of the page or to the next page or anything like that. Section 12 is your career narrative, and this is where you talk about how you've prepared yourself to go into the career field, the major that you have chosen, 
What, what, who, were there people that led you to that? Were there situations that led you to that? Um, the story I always tell is when I applied for this many years ago, um, my career narrative talked about how I wanted to be a meteorologist. And the reasoning for being a meteorologist was that when Hurricane Gilbert came through in 1988, um, it affected me. It scared me a lot because there were tornadoes everywhere, but it made me want to learn about what is a tornado, what is a hurricane. So for years, I wanted to be a meteorologist and a storm chaser. And then after time and figuring out that I probably wasn't good enough at uh, <laughs> calculus and things like that, um, my county agent and my 4-H program assistant in Bear County were the ones that really got me interested in pursuing an extension career. So talk about those kinds of experiences, any job opportunities that you've had that have led you to something, um, and how you decided between a bachelor's or an associate's degree. All those kinds of things are important to put in there. Section 13 is just for Courageous Heart applicants. Um, pages 11 and 12 are only completed if a 4 hr is being considered for Courageous Heart, which we already talked about. You must provide a detailed narrative of whatever obstacle you overcome or an experience. Um, include a page, there's a page listing three references that you will need um, of people that are familiar with your obstacle to talk about it. Uh, those three letters of recommendation are required from the references about um, the obstacle and how you have continued to be a strong 4-H'er even with living with whatever obstacle you have, um, you're working on or overcoming. Section 14 is, a, is an acknowledgement of integrity, your participation certification. This is a page where you and your parent will have to signature and initial certain things that are saying that everything that you have put in your application is true. You do not, it's saying that you are not lying about anything that you put in there and that's important. Um, and then you'll need to initial saying that your FAFSA and your college catalog pages and all those kinds of things are in there. It is important <clears throat> and your responsibility to ensure that your transcript, your test scores are correct. So when you turn that stuff in to me, make sure that the your test scores are from the ACT or the college board. That way we have those papers. Get two transcripts, a sealed one, and one that you can open up and see to make sure that all your information is true and correct on it. Um, and then our committee will, or my, I will open up your, um, your sealed envelope and make sure that all that information matches as well. Uh, section 15 is the agent certification, and I will fill this page out last once all the rest of your application is complete. Then I'll put all my signatures on there because that says that when I sign that, it shows that this application is complete and full and I have um, certified your application and you as a true 4-H'er and, and that you're actually applying for it. Um, and it must be signed by either myself, Sharla, Jeff, or Travis here at our extension office. Section 16 is an application checklist, and when you get this, it's going to be a bunch of different little um, signatures that you have to do, or uh, your initials. So you as the applicant will have to initial it, your parent initials it, I will initial it, and then it will be initialed at the higher levels as well. Um, I will only initial everything after everything else has been finished. This application is due in the county office on January 23rd, so be sure to start early and make sure you've taken all of your ACT, SAT tests and submitted your FAFSA. Get your information together before you start and be sure to read all the instructions. Ask several people that you respect and trust to review your and critique your application. Again, um, an essay written once is rarely effective. Complete all the sections thoroughly and emphasize quality as well as quantity. This is a competitive academic scholarship process. That means that grades are important. This application is complete, competing against applicants from all across Texas. These are the best of the best 4-H'ers that we've got. Applicants change each year, and just because it's a format or something worked last year does not necessarily mean that you will get the same results this year. 
the judges are every year and the applicants are different. Or the judges are different every year and applicants are different every year. So be sure to keep that in mind. Donors set these criteria, not 4-H, not the agents. Um, so don't be angry if you don't have minimum requirements. There are always other scholarships to apply for. Uh, make sure your grades are good and your college entrance exams are done. If you have questions, you can contact me at 830-303-3889. You can text me, find me on Facebook at Guadalupe County 4-H um, or any other way to contact. Over the next few slides, we're going to talk about some of our local scholarships or other scholarships that are available. The first one being the 4-H Booster Club Scholarship. There are four $300 scholarships available. They are based on 4-H participation. Um, the form is already on our website, uh, the updated form. And um, they will be due, along with the Bartoskowitz and the Miranda Scholarship, they'll be due June 19th, 2019. The Bartoskowitz Farm Scholarship is a $1,000 scholarship that you have to apply for. Uh, this application is also on our county website and selection is based on your 4-H participation in activities, academics, and community service. Um, again, this deadline is June 19th, 2019. The Miranda Memorial Scholarship is, a one, is one or two $500 scholarships that are based on a minimum 500 word essay about how you feel 4-H has changed your life. Um, there is no other form to fill out. You just must fill out the essay with proper heading that way we, we know and, and who the applicant is. And again, this is due June 19th, 2019. The McQueeny Lions Club offers 10 $1,500 scholarships. Be sure to check the McQueenie's Lions, McQueenie Lions Club website for details on these scholarships. Also, check other organizations like the other Lions Clubs in town, the Kiwanis Club, the Elks Club, um, and see if they have scholarships as well. I received an Elks Club scholarship many years ago because my great-granddad told me about the, the that they had a scholarship. So be sure to look into those things. The Wade Busby Memorial has up to 10 $500 scholarships and that you have to be actively enrolled in 4-H or FFA. If you are first or second in your class, you are not eligible um, and you had to have participated in the, the local youth show, the Lavernius Livestock Show, if you live in Wilson County, Bear County uh, Junior Livestock Show or the Wilson County Junior Livestock Show for at least two years. Um, and they say you have a B average because Wade Busby was a B average student and th that is an important selection criteria to um, Mrs. Busby and the donors. Um, the deadline is in April 2019. The County Extension Education Association has a one has one $500 scholarship that you will have to apply for. Um, to apply for it, you'll turn in a completed copy of your Texas 4-H record book and then there is a po possibility of an interview if we have a bunch of applicants. There's also a form that you will have to fill out. Um, this deadline is usually around the early part of February 2018. The Luling Foundation has a thousand dollar scholarship for agriculture um, and you must be going into an ag related field and you must be a resident of Guadalupe County as well. Um, that deadline is March 31st, 2019, and again, this is um, a scholarship that you, that you can apply for, but you must live in Guadalupe County. Looming Foundation also has health care scholarships available, and this can be used even if, if you're not going to a four-year university, but just a trade or vocational school to become a nurse um, uh, or a physician's assistant or whatever it is you can go and get this apply for the scholarship and uh, go to college with that it is also due march 31st 2019 be sure that if this scholarship asks for so many copies of your scholarship application that you fill out that many copies of the scholarship application our county youth show has four 500 dollars scholarships available there is an application and if needed there is an interview 
um, and you can see what the selection priority is on, it is good to have participated in the youth show in some form or fashion. Um, this is due April 1st, 2019, and they are usually presented in May around the end of school. The Fair Association has four or $500 scholarships available. Um, there's an application and possible interview. Uh, it's for students enrolled in agricultural or livestock studies. And fair involvement is also important in this scholarship. It's usually due mid-March of the year that you are applying. Um, and if your scholarship is chosen, it, could, it may also be chosen to go on to the next level to get the Texas Association Affairs, I think that's what it's called, um, to get their scholarship. And we have had several 4-H's from our counties, for our, from our county, get that scholarship in the past. So keep that in mind. GVEC has scholarships available. You can apply if your parents are, um, or guardians are GVEC customers or members. Um, you'll apply through their website and the deadline is March 1st, 2019. There are scholarships available through the Texas Big Game Awards Wildlife Conservation Group. Um, as you can see, they're $1,500 and $3,000 scholarships. Um, it is open to any field of study and you must attend your regional TBGA banquet in order to receive the scholarship. Um, go to their website. There's a link to their website on our county website and download the application. It must be postmarked by March 1st, 2019. The Texas, Texas Section Society for Range Management also has scholarships available. Um, if you are going into a range management or related ag field, so something like agronomy, um, those scholarships are there for you. They are $2,000 scholarships and they are due April 30th of 2019. Our County Farm Bureau has the George Washington Scholarship, uh, Farm Bureau Scholarship. I believe it is an essay that you have to write about how George Washington affected agriculture. Um, there is a $500 scholarship available. There are also other scholarships available through the Texas Farm Bureau, so be able to check them as well. Um, in order to get this, you must be a member of a Facebook family. Um, there's also the application will come out probably in January of 2019. The State Fair of Texas offers scholarships um, that you can apply for through their BigTex.com website. Um, you must have participated in this most current State Fair, the 2018 State Fair, in order to be eligible. The deadline is March 1st, 2019. San Angelo also has a number of uh, $1,000 scholarships available that are not related to the 4-H one. You must have participated, you must be participating or have participated in the San Angelo Stock Show. The deadline is May 1st, 2019 and you can go directly to their website to find that application. The same thing goes with the Houston Livestock Show Hildebrand and Exhibitor Scholarships. These are also $20,000 scholarships that require an application and an interview process. Um, the, for the exhibitor scholarships, you must have showed at the show. For the Hildebrand scholarship, it, I think you have to have shown in the Junior Market Lamb show in 2018 um, or 2019. So be sure that you apply for this scholarship. It is due February of 2019 um, and you can apply for that scholarship. There's also the Houston Ag Mechanics Scholarship. So you must be showing in the Ag Mechanics Show this coming year and provide your SAT and ACT scores. Go to rodeohouston.com, look up scholarships, and you'll get the information for those. If you are going to Texas A&M, the Mother's Club of Guadalupe County also has scholarships available attend for attending Texas A&M in the fall of 2019. There are several $500 scholarships available and their, de their deadline is March of 2019. You must have your acceptance by this date as well. Buck Fever also has scholarships available. Um, they are awarded in June 2019, but the deadline is in April. So be sure to check the, de the Buck Fever website for that form. Buckfever.org forward slash scholarship. GBRA also has some scholarships available. 
um, that you can apply for and you can go directly to their website it, it is not they may not be up yet but it'll be due around March of 2019 um, just keep in mind that you must be enrolled in a minimum tw 12 hours per semester to get this scholarship per year there are also scholarships available through LULAC your Alamo colleges or any other um, junior colleges out there um, a lot of those types of scholarships you need to go directly to their website to look up and get the information for them. As always, if you have any questions about the scholarship process, please contact us. We are here to help. Um, we want to make you as competitive as possible for these scholarships, um, and we want to see you be rewarded for all the things that you've done in 4-H and outside 4-H over the years. Um, one of the good things about this program is we get to see you grow up from being a little eight-year-old kid to a, a leader in our community. And so we want to make sure um, you are recognized for that and that you are, are rewarded for your work and commitment to the 4-H program. So um, thank you for listening to this presentation. And if you have any questions, please contact us.